Uh, Mr. B here, bringing you another wonderful math video. Uh, this one on uh, compositional functions. Uh, you know, this is one that's a little tricky, uh, but I think it's really important to have a good understanding of compositional functions, especially when we get into using the chain rule uh, to find derivatives, because, you know, the idea with the chain rule is it allows us to differentiate composite functions, so you need to be able to sort of identify when you have a composite function and you know what are the two functions or the three functions or however many you have and so this is a good idea to uh, just a little warm-up video for calculus kind of thing alright so um, some notation with composition of functions sometimes you'll often see this well if you don't know what a composition of function is it's simply when we take a function and we and compose it with another one so if we we would normally have um, f of x well instead of having just x it's f of g of x. So where x is, there's another function in place of it. So in a, you know, a typical example of that might be if you have, say, square root, well normally it'd just be y is equal to the square root of x. Well instead of having x, you would have, say, x to the 3. And so your two functions are, you know, the square root function and x to the cube. So there's two different functions happening there. Um, some more notations, sometimes you'll see this, f and a little o, almost some people call it fog, f of g of x, um, just a different notation. So either one of those is fine. I like this one personally because uh, it's it's clearly what we do. This one, you know, it's just different. Some people use it. I'm not a fan. All right, so um, let's have a look at an example. So this is, is what is f of g of x and g of f of x. So we have two different functions here f of x and I should say g of x here f of x is equal to 5x and g of x is equal to x squared so start off fairly straightforward so let's find f of gx first so f of g of x so what I like to do is I'm gonna keep my f here I'm just gonna replace my g of x with whatever g of x is so I'm x squared so f of x squared so now, basically, wherever I see an x in uh, f of x, I'm going to put x squared. So instead of having 5x, I'm going to replace that x with x squared. So I end up with 5x squared. So that's my f of g of x. g of f of x is going the opposite direction. So you're basically, you're putting in uh, f of x here instead of g of x. So we have f of 5x. So wherever I see an x in g of x, I got my f's mixed up here. So wherever I see an uh, 5x in g of x, I'm going to put, or sorry, wherever I see an x in g of x, I'm going to put 5x. So it's going to look like this, 5x squared. So I end up with, you square the 5, so 25x squared. So that's my f of g of x and g of f of x. So it's really just about, you know, substituting one formula, one function into the other, essentially, right? So it does get a little bit more complicated, especially when we look at domain and range and things like that. So this is another typical example. These exa A lot of examples have to do with... Um, have square roots involved because it does make it a little bit more complicated and what we have to recognize is that in this last example the domains and the ranges were the same so it didn't really affect much but if we look at this guy um, well the domain and range of this well the domain is all real numbers and the range is everything is greater than or equal to zero well the domain of this guy is everything has to be greater than or equal to two so there's two different ranges happening but let's first of all let's find f of g of x. So f of g of x. So I place my g of x with the function. So f of x minus square root of x minus two. So then I'm going to put my square root of x minus two anywhere I see an x in f of x. So it's going to go here for x. So I'm going to have uh, square root x minus two all squared is equal to x minus 2. So you end up with basically a linear function. Now the only thing about this is that 
if you look at these two things, I mean, they're really they're really different in one way that if I put a say a one in this function, I'm going to get a non-real answer. I'm not going to be able to do it because of the square root sign. But if I put it into this guy, it's going to exist. So what we have to recognize is that this is not just simply x minus 2. This has some restrictions on it. So we have to be aware of those restrictions. So when we're looking at the domain of composite functions, so the domain of composite functions, let me write that out. And I spelled it wrong, didn't I? Something you should know about me is I'm a horrific speller. So the domain of composite functions. So what we need to learn to know about it is that we often look to the inner function. So in this case, g of x. So we want to look to uh, the inner function. So the inner function is going to give us what we want to know about the domain. And in this case, g of x. So if we look at g of x, what we need to know is that what's underneath that square root sign has to be greater than or equal to zero. So x minus two has to be greater than or equal to 0 or x has to be greater than or equal to 2 so when we graph this we can't just simply graph x minus 2 because that's a line that's going to go through all real numbers we have to be aware that um, there's a restriction that x has to be greater than or equal to 2 so what I tell my students if you want to graph a composite function graph it before simplification so you want to graph this so if you graph that, you'll get an ap accurate representation of f of g of x. If you graph this, you will not. So what we have to be aware of, if that, you know, you have a qu test, test question that asks you to find the composite function, then graph it. You have to be aware of your restrictions. So when I graph this guy, and I'll just do, I think I have a sketch on the next page, uh, but I'll just do a quick little sketch here. I have to be aware that um, x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So let's so say 1, 2 right here. And then I have a line. Just go straight up like that. So it's not complete because, you know, your x is greater than or equal to 2. And if I put this in a graphing calculator, it's not going to do that for me. If I put this in a graphing calculator with my root sign before simplification, it will. So when you graph a composite function, take note of the inner function. Look for restrictions. And if you have a graphing calculator, graph before simplification. So really, really important. Uh, I think this is a possibly a graph. Yeah, absolutely. So this is just the graph that I did of it. I threw in into Desmos uh, or some other graphing program. Before simplification, this is what it shot me back. If it was after simplification, it threw me back the entire thing. And that's why you know restrictions, things like that are really, really important. It's because if I just showed you uh, this, everybody would tell me it's linear. No one would know about the restrictions. But if I show you this, where it came from, then everybody should recognize, yeah, there is a restriction on that. It has to be greater than or equal to 2. So it's really important to recognize that. So one of the things that I get my students to do in preparation for calculus is to try and pick out from a composite function, what are the what are the two functions that we have? And this should be a two here, just to keep it the same. Uh, what are the two functions that this thing is made of? So, what I've done here is I've created a couple of composite functions, fairly straightforward ones, and uh, try to pick out what are they composed of. What's my two functions? So, if I look here, I got an x minus two inside the brackets. So, I'm going to call my first function f of x is equal to x minus two. So then if that's x minus 2 inside the brackets, then, well, my second function can be this guy. So I have um, x squared plus x plus 5. So really what I had was g of f of x. f of x was subbed in for x to create h of x. And really similar thing here. Underneath the square root sign, I have my f of x or my g of x, whatever you want to call it, x squared minus 2. And then my um, my g of x is simply the square root of x. So I subbed in x squared minus 2 directly into this guy to create 
h of x. So that's really important because when we're doing the chain rule, we're going to be we're we're going to have to be able to differentiate those. So really important. Uh, I pulled this qu last question from a textbook, and the reason why I pulled it is because last year I gave this to my students and they found it for whatever reason they found it really difficult. So I thought it might have been uh you know just something I kind of overlooked. So I uh, might be overlooked in your class as well, but it's really straightforward question, but it's a great multiple choice question. So I'm going to do the first couple here. I'm not going to do all four, but um, let's do A. So F of G of negative 4. So let's look at, before we you know think about this whole thing, let's look at G of negative 4. So all that says is when G, when X is negative 4, what is the value of G of X or Y? Right, so when x is negative four, so let's look over here. X is negative four right here, and here's g of x right across the line. So I look at that point. Well, g of x is actually zero. So g of negative four, so g at negative four is zero. So now essentially, what I have to find, in order to find this, really what I need to know, well, that's zero. So what I'm actually finding is f of zero. So what's the value of f? when x is equal to 0. So when x is equal to 0 right here, I go up till I hit f. There it is right there. 2. So f of g of negative 4 is 2. So that's really the process. you got to find the inner function. What's that value? Sub it in. Find f. And then there she is. Let's do uh, c. Let's just go reverse. So g of f of negative 2 or c. Sorry. So f of negative 2. Let me erase this stuff over here. So f negative 2 right here, so there she is. So f negative 2 is 0. So when x is negative 2, f is 0. So then I'm going to look for when we have x equal to 0, what's the value of g? When x is equal to 0, the value of g is negative 4 right there. So that's equal to negative 4. So guys, like I said before, Composite functions is uh, sort of a passing topic in a lot of your calculus classes, but it's important later on when you get into more complicated derivatives with the chain rule and stuff like that. So don't overlook this because it's not going to be on a test or anything like that. You want to look at this as important. It's a foundational skill. Uh, if you want to get good at it, you got to do questions. So uh, hopefully this helps. I'll see you guys in class. Good luck.